Hey everybody, welcome back. This is the uh, second video on my Cree Cree build. This is going to go over the uh, status of my wing spars. I started working on these wing spars before I started doing the videos. So I'm just gonna catch up to speed on where I'm at with these at this point. Moving forward, uh, we will uh, try and make sure that we record the videos and record some more information as we're doing the build process. Yes, I'm building the world's smallest twin engine airplane. Before I get started, I do want to mention a couple things. Uh, number one, if you are interested in following along on another Cree Cree uh, build, one that's nearing completion, um, there's a builder in New Zealand, his name is Shannon, and uh, he's also known as uh, Mad Rocket Scientist on the homebuildairplanes.com forum. Um, I'm going to include a link at the bottom of this page and also along with the uh, YouTube video um, so that you can go to his forum page uh, that's, uh, like I said, on, on homebuiltairplanes.com. He's doing some amazing things with his Cree Cree build. I've been able to gather a lot of information from him, including some of the stuff that we're going to go over today with the wing spars. Uh, a lot of this information I received from him. Um, as far as things that I needed to watch for during my build process. Uh, like I said, Shannon's doing some amazing things where he's actually, uh, you know, instead of creating a, a fiberglass or balsa wood wing tips and nose and, and things like that on his airplane, he's actually taken aluminum and actually formed aluminum wing tips and aluminum nose. He's done some extreme CNC work with actually CNC uh, machining his own uh, wheel rims, his own uh, cylinder heads even for his engines because he wanted dual spark plugs instead of single spark plugs. So again, if you want to see a Cree Cree nearing completion and see you know pictures of the build process, you can go to his, his forum site. It's excellent. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up too is if you are not um, that involved with aviation, you might not know who Mike Patey is. If you are involved with aviation, you probably already know who he is, but his is another uh, YouTube page that I uh, watch his videos quite often. Uh, he's not building a Cree Cree, um, but if you wanna see a guy who's got basically unlimited funds and unlimited amount of energy, and see what kind of projects he's working on related to aviation. Uh, his page is amazing. Um, this is a guy who's built a Lancer Legacy and put a um, a uh, you know PT6 turboprop on it and set all kinds of time to climb and, and you know speed records with his aircraft. Uh, he's built recently an aircraft he calls Draco. It's actually a uh, um, a bush plane, like the ultimate bush plane. I mean, extreme bush plane with a PT, again, a, uh, a PT-6 turboprop on it. Uh, the aircraft actually crashed recently, but he's going to be building a new one called Draco X. Um, he's also uh, working, from what I understand, uh, another video I saw that somebody was interviewing him, he did, he did leak that he was working on a new replacement for his uh, his uh, turboprop legacy build where he's actually going to take a 1600 horsepower uh, PT-6 and install it on an aircraft. I don't know if it's a Lancer Legacy or not, um, but compare that to his Lancer Legacy that he set all these records in was 800 horsepower. So again, extreme builder. The, the build he's working on now is actually a bush plane that he's calling Scrappy where he's using what he's considering scrap parts and building a, uh, a, an ultimate bush plane. But the engineering uh, learning that you can get from, from watching him build uh, and uh, the, you know, he's working with carbon fiber and he's working with all kinds of, you know, uh, CNC machined parts and welded parts. And, you know, he, he's taking aviation to the extreme. So it's worth, it's worth, a, 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 it's worth checking out. I'll include the link here in this page. Also, again, it's just something that's fun to watch. Um, but anyway, so moving forward with where I'm at now. So uh, I have worked and started, as I mentioned in the previous video, uh, with the wing spars on the Cree Cree. That's where I started with. It was strictly because I wanted to finish this 
uh, frame four where these wings actually fit into in the fuselage, which allowed me to move right away into starting to build the fuselage. Um, so where I'm at now, I have built or assembled basically the right and left wing spars of the Cree Cree to where they're almost ready to be riveted. So what I've done is I cut out these uh, spar webs, uh, which is the center section here in the wing spar on my CNC machine. I did pre-drill all of the holes that are in here for the uh, web stiffeners that the wing ribs will attach to. Um, the spar caps themselves, which are these angles that are on either side of this web material here, I did cut those out on my CNC machine and I did pre-drill them on my CNC machine. So this is the, uh, this is the right wing spar and I'll show you here the left, left wing spar which is slightly different. Um, construction similar but it actually has a forked part here where the right wing spar will actually fit inside of the left wing spar inside the airplane and there are holes that get drilled here with pins that connect these two pieces together inside the airplane. So the, 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 the wings themselves on the Cree Cree are a you know, quickly removable, pull a couple pins out and these wings come right off the airplane. Um, so again, I've, I've gotten to the point where these are almost ready to be riveted together. Um, I do have a little bit more work that has to be done on this left wing spar because there are some uh, tapered plates that need to be installed in here that actually help control uh, the actual angle of these two pieces so that these pieces will fit together properly, uh, you know, once they're, they're riveted and assembled. Um, there's also some rivets inside of here that have to be uh, countersunk and dimpled um, in order for these parts to fit together properly. So I've got a few more things that I need to do on this before it's completely ready to be disassembled and, you know, uh, deburred and cleaned up and, and alloyed. Um, but let's talk about how I got here a little bit because there's been several things that I have had to be careful of, some modifications that I've had to do, um, and I, I, I actually, the first set of spar caps that I did, uh, I actually scrapped, um, and so we'll talk about that too. So the spar caps themselves are basically eighth inch aluminum angles that are attached to the top and bottom of each one of these spars. Um, these aluminum angles are, uh, are, were actually machined on my CNC machine. So I machined this taper all the way down this eight foot six inch length of this spar. Um, I did uh, pre-drill all of these holes to three thirty seconds, um, three thirty seconds of an inch so that I could assemble these together with three thirty seconds Clicos um, immediately to start out with, get these holes aligned and then finally drill them to eighth inch on my, uh, on my milling machine or you can use a uh, drill press to do that. Um, so we need to talk about these angles a little bit because these angles are a problem on the Cree Cree when you purchase them from aircraft spruce, which most people would do. So let's, let's go into that real quick. The, the issue here, there's two issues here. Number one, in the plans they specify that you use 32 millimeter wide angles. Again, this is a French design, so everything in the plans for the most part is in, uh, is in you know, metric or millimeters. Um, you do have to convert a lot of things to uh, you know, imperial inches. Um, there are actually specifications in the plans for conversions already. So the assumption is, is that uh, for example, it mentions that these angles are supposed to be 3.2 millimeters, but it does have a conversion in there to say that that's eighth inch angles. So they do a good job of, of letting you know with wing skin thicknesses and you know sheet metal thicknesses of what the equivalents are for uh, converting from millimeter to uh, inch specification. So the plan specify to use 32 millimeter wide angles in the um, um, you know in the parts list. Uh, or basically the material list. Now, what I did then is I took that number, which converts to about an inch and a quarter, and went to Aircraft Spruce and picked the next size up from there because uh, Aircraft Spruce didn't carry inch and a quarter, they only had one inch and they had an inch and a half. Now, what I found out after I cut the first set is that, is that actually the widest part of this 
uh, tapered angle is actually less than one inch. So I could have, with the first set of spars I made, actually bought one inch by one inch, eighth inch thick aluminum angle stock material, and I could have used that for creating these spars. Um, so that's obviously what I did in my second set. Uh, if I had done that on a first set, it probably would have saved me about $250. So uh, make sure when you're purchasing materials for the Cree Cree that you consider what's in the material list, but that material list is assuming that you're buying metric-based uh, stock parts from aircraft suppliers in you know Europe. And obviously 32 millimeter was the closest size up from what the uh, minimum requirement is for the materials that you're producing. Uh, but again, one inch angles is all you need, one inch by uh, eighth inch uh, thick material. Now, the critical part that you're gonna run into right away when you cut these angles and you drill these holes and you go to fit your rivets in is the radius that is in these angles that we're purchasing from aircraft sprues is actually considerably bigger than the radius that was obviously in the plans. Now, I don't know what this radius is supposed to be. Uh, I just know based on the interference fit between the rivet holes and the rivets you're inserting and that radius uh, that we're dealing with a much bigger radius than what was in the plans. And this is kind of a known issue throughout the you know, Cree Cree build community, um, even in Europe that purchases stuff from aircraft sprues that we've got a problem with this radius inside of here being much larger. And I've got a, you know, this is the angle here, the angle material one inch by one inch. And this radius inside of here has already been milled down to a smaller size because there's two fixes for this issue. Number one is you can mill this radius down to a smaller size. Um, or you can actually move the rivet holes down half a millimeter, one millimeter, um, whatever it is to try and eliminate some of this interference. And um, <clears throat> the problem is, is that we don't really know exactly what we can mill this radius down to. Now I did a little bit of research on the internet and I found that I could get um, eighth inch structural aluminum angle with a radius in it of uh, 0.125, which is an eighth of an inch. This particular material that we get from aircraft spruce that's in one inch, an inch and a half, actually has a 0.188 radius. So it's almost 3 16th of an inch radius inside of here. Um, and uh, I did not feel comfortable milling this radius down any further than 0.125, which is an eighth of an inch. Um, only because I couldn't find any place where they would specify that structural aluminum angle had a radius less than the basically the thickness of the material. So this is eighth inch aluminum angle. It seems to me that it makes sense that the radius should have a minimum of the thickness of the material, which is eighth inch radius. So, um, so the fix, like I said, is either mill that radius down, which most people don't have the equipment to do that or actually move the rivet holes to, um, you know, to make a little bit of clearance in there. Now, I milled my radius on the first set that I made. I milled it down to 0.125. I left the rivets in the spot they were specified in the plans, which is 7.5 millimeters from the top. And I still ended up with interference fit problems between the rivets and the uh, the radius and I'll try and show that here. Hopefully in this hopefully you can see this in the video But this rivet is pushed all the way down until that rivet head is now hitting this This radius inside of here even though I've milled this radius down now part of the reason I ended up with this problem here with this fit even though I milled the radius is that the holes tended to move when I drilled them uh, so when I did the first set I made, I CNC pre-drilled my, my spar web. So I drilled 16 16th inch holes every place there was supposed to be a rivet head or a rivet installed in the spar caps and I drilled it into this. And then what I did is I took this undrilled spar cap that wasn't drilled to begin with and I lined it up on top of here and then I drilled through the back side of these pre-marked holes that were 16th inch through the spar caps to drill the spar caps. Um, 
And so what I did is I laid that out with uh, you know one spar cap over the top of this web, drilled through it, and then I attached both the spar caps across the ends like you see on this, this, this final you know, finished one, and drilled back through the cap, through the spar web, and through the other cap to drill all the way through it. And I did that all with the uh, you know, 3 30 seconds bit initially, and then I went back through and re-drilled them all out to eighth inch, which is the final you know, drilled size for, uh, for the eighth inch rivets. That caused several problems. Um, number one, uh, there was no guarantee that I got these spar caps perfectly aligned on top of that spar web. So when I drilled through the spar web, through the spar cap, the holes had the tendency to move a little bit. And then when I drilled back through them, all the way from the one spar cap through the other spar cap, if I didn't drill that hole perfectly straight, even I even did it on my drill press, and they ended up wandering a little bit uh, up and down on the, the spar cap, um, which made it so that actually some of the holes that I drilled were actually closer than 7.5 millimeters from the top of the cap. Uh, which even created a bigger issue with the interference fit with this radius inside of here. Um, the other factor was too, is that since I drilled all these initially through with a uh, 332nd bit, which is a fairly small bit, it has a tendency to, to, to flex. And as that bit flex, I think it had a tendency to make the holes uh, wander even a little bit more. And then of course, drilling them out to eighth inch, which was another whole step, um, by the time I got done, I was not satisfied with the hole locations and this fit between these rivets, uh, these rivet heads. Now, this causes a, a whole other issue when you consider the fact that the plans um, are assuming that you're installing a flat rivet in these holes. Uh, again, you know, these plans were written up in the 1970s, you know, very early 1980s, um, and at the time in Europe, um, they specified that there was two types of rivets, that we had uh, flathead rivets and we had countersunk rivets. Now, today in aviation, we basically have two types of rivets also. We've got a countersunk rivet, which is designed to be a flat rivet that's you know finished flat with the surface of the sheet metal. Um, it's a countersunk rivet. Or we have what's called a universal head rivet. Now, a universal head rivet is basically a round head rivet, although the head itself is not perfectly round. It's actually more of an oval shape. Um, <clears throat> the universal rivet head was um, designed to standardize all rivet heads that were above the, or that protruded from the surface of the material. So this is universal rivet head is designed to replace every other type of above the surface rivet head, like a round head, a flat head, any other kind, um, this a universal can replace any of those rivets. And it was designed to standardize to a specific type of rivet head in military spec for aircraft. And this has become the standard rivet uh, for, um, for above the surface, you know, non-countersunk rivets. Um, but in the plans, they're indicating that these rivets that are installed on these spar caps are actually flathead rivets. Well, we don't have a flathead rivet. We've got a universal rivet, which is not flat. But when you look at the plans and they talk about how to rivet these spar caps together, they're indicating that you basically use a flathead rivet set on a flathead rivet and you pound these rivets in. Now, if if I look at the at using a flathead rivet set, I can get that flathead rivet set right next to the edge of this material, and I could pound this rivet in. And I could let that rivet bend around that radius and flatten that rivet and have a rivet installed that would probably be just fine. In fact, most Cree Cree builders have done just that. They've taken a universal head rivet, They've used the flat rivet set, as they mentioned inside, you know, in the manual, and they've set that rivet and allowed it to bend a little bit over that radius. Um, but if you understand how riveting is supposed to work, and you know, being a, a, an aircraft mechanic myself, a, a certified AMP mechanic, um, 
it's not proper to set a universal head rivet without using a universal head rivet set. This is an ANN 470 rivet set designed to work with an ANN 470 rivet, and it's curved to shape to the same shape as a rivet head, so it maintains that rivet head shape when it's installed. But you can see that when you install this rivet in here, I've got the interference issue with the, the uh, with the radius there, but I cannot set this rivet with this rivet set. Um, not only because it's too wide and it hits the top of here, but if I were to pound that rivet flat um, all the way down till it wasn't um, it wasn't protruding any longer, this rivet set here would actually create and damage this spar cap. Um, it would create what's called a smiley in the aircraft industry. In other words, this curved, a rounded and curved a rivet set would actually make a curved rivet uh, or a curved indentation in my spar cap here. It may even damage the rivet head itself and create a, uh, a smiley on the rivet uh, head itself also. So I can't set these rivets properly with a proper rivet set um, with this uh, large radius here and with this interference fit with the rivet head on the spar cap. So because I didn't want to set these rivets with a flat rivet set and, and I want to prep, you know, I want to, I want to say any Cree Cree builder who has done this already, who has set these ANN 470 rivets, these universal rivets with a flat rivet set, I don't think you're going to have any issues with the spar caps and these rivets. Um, so I don't believe that this is a problem for anybody who's done this before. What I'm really saying is that from an aircraft mechanic standpoint, I am not gonna set a universal rivet head without using a universal rivet head set and actually set it, you know, putting these, installing these rivets properly um, from an aircraft mechanic perspective. Um, when we're talking about doing this correctly or not, we're just, we're just talking about, you know, standard practices. We're talking about, you know, we're not talking about what's going to fail on this aircraft during normal use. We're talking about what's going to fail first when somebody pulls 10 G's on these wing spars, which are rated to break at nine. Uh, so again, I, I just want to preface that, that anybody who's done this before or set these before, according to the, uh, according to the, the manual, um, I don't think you're going to have any problem with it. And I wouldn't worry about flying in any aircraft who set that, you know, those rivets properly or set those, you know, according to the manual. So what I ended up doing then for my second set of spars is I really wanted to fix this rivet problem so that I could install the universal rivet head, install it properly on a flat surface and actually set it with a, an ANN 470 rivet set. So what I did is a combination of the fixes that are, 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 are out there for, um, for taking care of this, this larger radius issue on these aluminum angles. So what I did is I milled these down, I milled my angles down to 0.125 on the radius, um, down from 0.188, which is what they come at yeah, as from aircraft spruce, which was the minimum I felt comfortable reducing that radius to on a structural aluminum angle. Uh, without an engineer, an engineer telling me I could go less. Um, only because I found out doing the research on the internet that I could actually buy structural aluminum angles with that smaller radius. They weren't available from aircraft screws. There wasn't an actual place I could get them from. Uh, so it's not like I could go out and buy it with that smaller radius. Um, I just saw that manufacturers out there were specifying both sizes, the 0.188 and the 0.125. Um, so, I milled the radius down, and then the other thing I did is I moved the rivet heads down one and a half millimeters on the spar cap. Now, what that meant, though, is that I had to I had to make this wider, uh, create a wider surface where the rivets were in order to maintain a proper edge distance of these rivets to the lower edge of this spar cap. So I moved the rivets down 1.5 millimeters, which isn't a lot when you think about, it's, we're talking millimeters here, one and a half millimeters. And what I had to do is make the spar cap itself one and a half millimeters taller. So these are these new ones that I created are 16 and a half millimeters tall um, with the rivet, rivets themselves, holes moved down uh, 1.5 millimeters. Now, from what I understand from other Cree Cree builders in Europe, um, 
that's an acceptable practice as far as moving the rivet heads in order to get around this radius issue. Like I said, I did both. I think it's the, it's the best solution um, for this rivet problem uh, without you know, saying that we've modified anything structurally within the aircraft and are creating any kind of issue. Now I'm gonna try to show you here uh, what this does for these rivet holes. Okay, so if we put this rivet in now, and hopefully you can see this in the video. So this, this rivet is now completely flush with the cap itself. This is going to now allow me to use an a and 470 rivet set to set these rivets properly. Now it actually still does just barely hit this the side of this spar cap. So what I'll probably do is I'll you know, I'll put this on a lathe and I'll, uh, you know, take some diameter off of this, which doesn't need to be there, so that I can make sure that I can set these without running into the cap here and damaging it at all. But this allows for proper installation of an AN470 rivet without a lot of modification. And to me, this is the way that these rivets should be installed, you know, to be proper. Now you can actually still see on this, you can see where I milled that radius because I haven't sanded down or, or cleaned any of this up yet after the milling process. And you can see the little line there, and that rivet is just crossing over that line where I milled it. Um, but the rivet head is completely flat, and I don't have to worry about any kind of, uh, you know, those rivets sitting up higher or being misshapen when I actually go and set them. So to me, this is the best solution. Uh, I'm very happy with how it came out. Uh, and on this second set of spar caps that I created, I actually went back to the drawings and I took off all of the rivet holes that I had specified in the web that were related to the spar cap. I still left these rivet holes in the middle for the, um, the, the, the web stiffeners that need to be installed. I think I showed those in those last videos. That was that bag of those small little uh, parts that need to be bent. Um, I left those in there, but I did have to go back and modify my drawings to remove all the rivet holes from the web. I had to relocate these rivet holes for those uh, those spar stiffeners, because now I had to make those, you know, those in total between the top and the bottom cap had to be three millimeters smaller in order to fit in there. And of course, to center the rivets, I had to move those rivet holes too. Um, but I ended up drilling all of these holes in these spar caps, and I'm not sure you can see them from back there, but there's a lot of holes in here. I mean, I ended up drilling all of these spar cap holes into the caps themselves on the CNC machine, which made sure that they were in the exact spot that they needed to be in. I pre-drilled them also to 330 seconds, which allowed me to fit the 330 seconds Clecos, which is the smallest size Clecos I could get um, in there. Uh, and then what I did is once I had those two caps put together properly on either side, and there's actually a tool that the manual tells you that you should make, which looks like this. And what this does is it allows you to put it over the spar caps or the spar web and align the caps so that you get a proper distance. And so what you end up doing is you put two of the spar caps on there. You uh, drill, or I'm sorry, what I ended up doing first was I put one cap on either side of the web using this tool through here. And then I drilled through the web in certain spots like I show here where these clecos are. And then what I was able to do is just take the other cap and Clico right to it. So I was able to Clico the assembly together fairly quickly with the 330 seconds uh, Clicos um, and have good alignment already. Then I went back and I re-drilled all of the holes to an eighth inch on the, uh, on the drill press. Um, and that uh, seemed to work out perfectly. I've got perfect alignment of everything. The holes are in the perfect spot and I'll be able to rivet all this together properly using a proper a and 470 rivet set. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about, number one, how did, I, how did I mill this radius? How did I get that radius milled in there? Because most people wouldn't be able to do that. Now, you might think I used my CNC machine, but I didn't. Uh, part of the reason I didn't use the CNC machine was I couldn't find an easy way to mount a nine foot piece of angle on my table and get it perfectly straight. Um, these angles don't come perfectly straight. They've got a little bit of bend to them this way. They, they could have a little bit of bend to them this way. And trying to figure out how to bolt or attach or secure 
a one by one angle to my table so that that bit could precisely cut down the, the you know the, the base of this this um, this radius. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable that I could even get within you know the thousandths of an inch that I would need to get in order to make sure that that uh, radius when it was being cut wasn't wandering off and, and possibly damaging the cap itself. So uh, what I ended up doing is I actually created a fixture for my milling machine. Um, and what this does is I'm able to mount this in the milling machine. I was able to set the bit on the mill in the exact spot I needed by, you know, I could still move the table uh, on the mill in and out to get that position right. And then what I was able to do is I have two adjustments here on these plates on the end so that I could control the amount of friction pushing in on these angles on the end. And then I attached a separate plate on top that was adjustable where I could screw down tension on top of these angles. And what I did is I made it so I could just feed these angles in one end of this tool and push it through the milling machine similar to you know cutting wood on a table saw. Now this was a very manual process. I mean, obviously I couldn't push this through very fast at all because this is a, uh, you know, a milling bit that's cutting into aluminum. So it took a couple hours to push 72 feet of angle through my milling machine, but I got an absolutely perfect milled uh, radius inside these and uh, it, this tool worked great. Um, like I said, it was, it was quite a manual process, uh, but uh, I'm very happy with how it all turned out. Um, so that's how I ended up milling that radius. Uh, and like I said, what I, what I ended up doing on the, uh, on the CNC table is I was able to get two of these angles um, you know, put in there end to end, and I was able to mill not only the, or cut down not only the, uh, the, the width to that 16.5 millimeters, but I was able to accurately drill all the holes and then flip them over and cut the taper um, on the CNC machine. Um, I do have some pictures of that. I'll try to you know, insert that into the, into the video here. So, um, so that took care of the angle issue um, with the spars. Um, but the other issue that uh, some of the builders reported and let me know about before I actually got to the point of, of drilling and riveting some of these parts is that um, in the plans, there is an additional modification that you can do to strengthen the wings. Um, and the purpose of it is, is if you're doing a lot of aerobatics in the aircraft, um, because it's aluminum, aluminum fatigues. Uh, in other words, if you keep bending something back and forth and back and forth, eventually it'll break. Uh, and what they determined is that the bottom of these spars, spar caps, um, that if they put a doubler on top of here, and what it is, is after this is all done, after this is all riveted together, you actually go back and you layer a piece of aluminum that's an eighth inch thick on top of this spar cap. It goes right on top of here. And of course, as, as typical in uh, the Cree design, everything's tapered. So literally that piece that you're installing here goes from here, goes down here, and goes down here. And it is, the thickest parts here, it's tapered all the way down to nothing in both directions. Um, and then it has to be shaped the shape of this. It's, it, it's gonna be a crazy thing to actually try and, 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 and make and finish. It's gonna be time consuming. But you bond that on top of this spar cap here on just the bottom cap. So here on the other side and then on the, both sides of the bottom of the, uh, of the left wing spar. And what that does is it increases the fatigue time by a factor of 10 for these wings, um, which is a, you know, a, that's a great mod to do because, you know, what will eventually happen is these wings will crack here. Um, you know, it takes 90,000 cycles, you know, now times a factor of 10 before that would happen. Uh, but uh, it, it does add some additional uh, support and, um, you know, to the wings. So it, it's a good mod to do. Uh, but what happens then is because the right spar fits inside of the left spar. Um, when they slide together, there's actually some plates that are on this spar here on the inside that need to be modified in order to get past the additional height 
of this dog board that's put on here, what it amounts to. So I have not drilled the end holes in this spar, on the left spar, primarily because those rivet holes need to be in a different spot because on the back side, because it's riveted all the way through, um, on the back side of here, there's a plate that goes on here that needs to be riveted through the, the, the spar cap on the top and bottom and through that plate, but that plate needs to be cut short by a quarter inch on the bottom and an eighth inch on the top so when it slides together with the, uh, with the other wing panel that they clear. Um, in addition to that though, there's rivets that are for this cap and this cap on the bottom that go through and are, are obviously riveted on the other side with either you know a rivet head there or a, you know the rivet tail there that will end up hitting that um, that doubler as they are slid together. So you actually have to countersink. Uh, you actually drill and countersink these caps, and you actually have to dimple these skins so that you can install a flush rivet uh, inside that area there to prevent that interference. Um, now, if I hadn't known that, I could still do this mod, but when I got done, I would have had to cut, you know, half the rivet heads off on the inside of there uh, to make those things so they fit together, or I would have had to have, you know, gone back and actually put a, 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 a you know, filed or sanded a uh, bevel into that doubler in order to get those things to fit together. So, because I know that, I, I can actually fix this before it's actually uh, final riveted and make sure that everything's going to go together a little bit better and not have to worry about doing that later. Um, so let's talk about, let's talk about the bend. Obviously these spar caps were not only CNC cut, CNC drilled, milled, but they had to be bent. Um, the manual actually goes into uh, showing you how to make a, a tool that you can use to bend these spar caps, which is what I did. Um, that's this tool here um, and what it essentially is is you build a plate and then in here are two adjustable um, parts that actually allow you to adjust the angle and you can slide those spars into the end here and then simply by pushing down on this um, it will actually bend those spars to the, uh, the correct dimensions or correct uh, angle. Um, I believe the, the, this angle here is, is four degrees um, and then you also have to do another bend to get to create this fork here you actually have to bend here these out by 1.8 degrees uh, to get that uh, angle correct. Um, but you can use this tool that they show you how to make or at least give you a diagram on how to make in, uh, in the manual. I put a little window in here so I could actually mark where the spot was and then I'd look for that when I, when I fed the uh, you know, piece in here. For example, this one's already bent. Um, but what you end up doing is uh, sliding it into the end here. We'll slide this in here. To the marked spot that you have in the cap and then you can put the uh, other piece in here, like so. And what I ended up doing is, I, I literally, I just put this in a six inch vise, I put it in horizontally, and I just cranked the vise down and it bent these to the right, uh, right um, angle. Now, the only thing I would caution you on this is that when I bent my first set of spars, I stuck them in here, I cranked it all the way down, I you know, took it out, I took the part out, and I had actually bent these farther than what they indicated you would actually bend them to if you used the proper you know, angles and you used this pre-made uh, part, which I think, it's, I think it's angled at seven degrees. Um, but the only thing I would caution you on bending these spars is, uh, actually under bend it. Don't, don't, don't crank it down all the way. You're better off under bending it and having to bend it further than bending it too far and having to bend it back. Um, obviously, if you bend it too far and you bend it back, you're adding in additional fatigue automatically by 
uh, by having to bend it too far and then bend it back than it is if you just keep bending it a little bit more to the right angle. So I would say just be careful when you're bending these to make sure that you don't bend them too far. You're better off doing it two or three times and getting it right the first time than bending it too far. <coughs> uh, so uh, I'm trying to think what else here. So I, again, uh, this is where I'm at at this point. I didn't get all that far. Um, you know, to finish these spars, what I've got to do is I've got to countersink and dimple these uh, uh, these parts in the end here. Everything has to be taken apart and deburred and cleaned up and, you know, sanded and, you know, made sure everything's clean. Uh, we do have to allodyne everything. And then we'll go back and there are some things that have to be bonded uh, with epoxy. Um, there's actually, I don't know if you can see it here. There's actually two pieces of aluminum here. There's one piece that goes basically end to end, and there's a doubler that goes on top of here. Um, so there's actually two thicknesses of um, sheet metal in between here, and this one piece that you see here is actually tapered uh, down on the inside to uh, you know virtually nothing, so it tapers down. Uh, but that has to be bonded together with the spar web that's behind it and the spar web that's on top uh, with an epoxy glue. And then at the other end here, there's also a, again, this is the weight savings. I mean, this is, this is, this is 32 thousandths of uh, aluminum here on this spar web that goes from here to the end. But then what they did is they put a, um, um, a plate here to connect a 20 thousandths piece from here to the end. And obviously this is the end of the wing. Um, if you think about the, the uh, you know, force that's on a wing, there's a much less of a force out here than there is from here down in because the force has to transfer from the end of the spar all the way into the airplane. Um, you're actually able to use a thinner material out here and that's exactly what they did. They actually have you install a thinner material out here than here, again, it's just to save weight. Um, I don't think I mentioned this before, but let's talk about weight a second. So, I added 1.5 millimeters to the height of these caps in order to move these rivets that 1.5 millimeter away. Believe it or not, that 1.5 millimeters that I added here, which was now added to every single cap on here, and there's eight of them. So I added 1.5 millimeters to basically eight foot six of these wing spars and to, to uh, to eight different spar caps. If you calculate that out, I actually added almost a half a pound to the weight of this aircraft just by making that modification. That's a big deal. Um, it may not seem like a big deal because what's a half a pound, but when you're talking about an airplane that only weighs 175 pounds, uh, a half a pound is, is, is a lot. Um, but I still think it was a necessary change to make to this airplane to make it so that this uh, you know, these rivets could be installed properly. Um, and like I said, I don't believe I'm deviating from uh, anything from an engineering perspective. If anything, I've made the wings stronger uh, by adding that material, but I have made them heavier too. Uh, and there's, so there's, you know, there's, there's drawbacks to everything. Um, so hopefully uh, next video, which will be the second spar cap video or spar video, I will have these done. We'll have these allodyne, we'll have them you know, fit together. Um, that's hoping. We'll, that's what I'm hoping to cover within the next uh, next video in the next couple weeks. Um, I think that's it. So we'll see you in the next video.